uh, really, really worth watching. I keep telling people to watch it. I will shout myself hoarse until everybody in the room has seen it. It's really good. So that's input processing. Let's sort of work our way up the stack, um, figuring out how we, uh, how we secure each layer. So let's start at the bottom with just the, the, uh, the transport layer, the stuff that's under HTTP, right? Uh, which is TCP or TLS. Um, and the most obvious thing to do there, if you want to apply security at that level, is deploy SSL, right? You can use your platform's SSL libraries. Um, you can put a, uh, a TLS terminating proxy in front of it. A lot of people who use FAE put S-Tunnel in front of it, which just terminates TLS and there's, does TCP to your backend. Um, and it, because it just knows about TCP, it doesn't break web sockets or anything. It doesn't try and do any HTTP stuff. Um, but other proxies work too, depending on what you're doing. You can use Apache or Nginx, that might work for your use case. Um, especially now Nginx has web sockets. Um, and then you just get your clients to connect over WSS or HTTPS, depending um, what, type of, uh, what type of thing you're doing. And what that protects against is because TLS does authenticated encryption, um, what that means is it encrypts messages and it also signs the encrypted messages so it can tell whether it's been modified in flight. Um, so this protects you against eavesdropping by the network users because you've encrypted it. It protects you against uh, you receiving messages that have been modified by, it, by an eavesdropper because it's authenticated. Um, and it also protects you because it, does, uh, because it um, verifies the identity of the server that you're talking to. It prevents you getting XSS. For example, if you're doing JSONP and someone has modified the DNS, that means that you're not actually getting JavaScript from the host you think you're getting it from. Um, TLS can defeat that because uh, it actually does like host identity verification. Uh, again, all in theory, this has sort of been broken in various ways, but in theory, this is what it all does. So a layer up, going from the transport layer up to HTTP, what can we apply there? So the most common um, sort of security mechanism that we use for a broad class of HTTP stuff is cookies. Um, we use it to identify who is making a request. You know, we, we, identi we use it to identify sessions to say who the user is that's making this request and make um, access control decisions based on that. Um, but they're not quite as great for web sockets as you'd think. Um, and I'll get into that now. So cookies work by, um, say, my website sends a post request to my server and then the server responds with a set cookie. And it scopes the cookie to uh, this domain and all the parts on that domain. And that's fine. That's what we expect to happen. But now this other site over here, because remember the browser, doesn't, um, the browser doesn't apply any origin restrictions on web sockets. This other site can just go, I want to make a web socket to your domain. And the browser, whenever you make any request, implicitly attaches any cookies that apply, that are scoped to that request, um, to it. So what this means on the wire is that you get your, um, your WebSocket stuff that has host and origin in its upgrade, and it's got the cookie that you set. So if you just trust that blindly, it means that this website now has all the access control privileges of the user who's logged into here. So um, the most obvious thing to do is to check this origin header, which is a header that browsers don't let uh, JavaScript modify. It says where the request came from in theory, uh, and you can check that. So cookies aren't great for this by default, but there's stuff you can do to make them better. Um, what they get in the, in the best case is that uh, they prevent unauthorized data access because they identify the person who's making the request, and they stop you from being able to execute stuff that you shouldn't be allowed to, like changing data that you shouldn't have access to. If you must use them, there's a few things you bear in mind. You should check the origin header. Um, both because you just might want to only allow connections from certain places in the first place, but also if you're going to use cookies, you need to make sure that that request is actually coming from your website. Otherwise, um, you, you're, you're giving everyone else on the internet access to that user session. Um, you should set the HTTP only flag because that stops JavaScript being able to read the session. So if you have a cross-site scripting attack, they can't steal your session, post it to someone else, and then have them act as you. Um, you should set the secure flag, which means that that cookie will only be delivered over, um, over SSL, SSL connections, so it can't be stolen by network, network eavesdroppers. Um, and you shouldn't, if you're doing cores, you shouldn't authenticate cores stuff with cookies for the same reason, because cores is all about allowing other origins access via JavaScript to your API. 
So if you're using cookies for that, you're basically giving all those other websites the privileges of the logged in user, which is bad. Um, you should use server. You should store sessions on the server instead of on the instead of in the cookie itself. Um, I know various frameworks like Rails does this by default. It stores sessions by putting all that data in the cookie and uh, encrypting it. Um, I won't. I can't go into detail about why that's bad right now. But if you want to know, ask me. And when you're doing sessions, make sure you generate really large IDs for these. A lot of protocol specs that are being written right now recommend you use at least 160-bit session IDs. However, this isn't great because like origin can be guessed. Um, like it doesn't. Like this thing just says. I came from this domain in it, but that's not proof, right? Anybody could write, you know, whatever server-side script they want that does that. And there have been ways of spoofing it in the browser using crafted redirects. Um, and uh, the other reason the cookies are bad is that they they're only sent when the the initial connection is made. So that connection is going to last for a long time, and messages are going to be coming into it. And the only access control that you have is what it sent on first connection. So you can't start disallowing it to do stuff um, after that, like during the lifetime of connection, because uh, there's no modification of its identity for the whole uh, for the lifetime of the connection. So it's better if you want to be able to change access control to do that in your messaging protocol rather than at the HTTP layer. So moving up on final level, how do we secure the messaging protocol itself? What kind of problems are here? Well, in Fay, this means like restricting access to people to subscribe to channels, so uh, not letting them read data that they shouldn't have access to, and uh, restric re restricting access to publication, not letting people write stuff into the system if they shouldn't be allowed to. Um, so for example, you could imagine doing that by, if someone wants to make a subscription, um, they include their user ID in there, and then some signature that like proves that this user ID is actually coming from who it says it is. I'll get into how to generate that in just a second. And Faye provides a, a mechanism for doing this um, because it lets you filter messages as they're going into and out of both the client and the server. So you can add stuff to them, change them, stop them being delivered if you want. Um, so we could write an extension that says when a, mes when a message is outgoing from the client, uh, just attach those credentials to it and then send it on. On the server side, we have an income ex incoming extension. And it says, if the message channel is meta subscribe, we're trying to make a subscription, it will check those credentials, and it will say, if these are valid, or if they're not valid, then attach an error to the message. And that will stop the back end processing it. So you would, the, the subscription will be denied. Um, what the validation method will probably do is I will, it will check, is the user allowed to subscribe to that channel? And also, does the token prove that that user ID is valid? So generating tokens, I've seen so many bad token generation implementations out there from people who don't know anything except MD5. Um, basically, if you want to sign data and prove that it is genuine, that it actually came from your software, you should use something like HMAC. Don't use SHA-1, don't use MD5, don't use basically hashing functions. Uh, HMAC stands for hash-based message authentication code. That MAC bit is the important part. These are algorithms that are designed specifically for signing information. Hash functions aren't designed for that, and you shouldn't use them. And this is really easy to do. Every, every platform has libraries for doing this. In Node, it's just a question of make me an HMAC with a certain hashing function with a secret key with something you store on your server and um, uh, passing the data that you want to sign and then ask for the digest of it. And that will spit out a bunch of hexadecimal stuff. And then you can just include the user ID and, and that signature as JavaScript variables on your pages. And then your client can pick that up and use it. And because uh, different tabs don't have access, or different origins don't have access to each other's uh, DOMs and each other's JavaScript runtimes, those variables will be kind of safe, depending on what third-party stuff you're including on your website. So this protects against uh, unauthorized access to publish publishing and subscription. And it also prevents fraudulent requests from other sites, because they can't get access to the credentials that you need to do it unless they're actually operating on your, uh, on your pages. Final anti-pattern I want to mention, I've got just like a minute and a half left. Um, I want to mention this because I have seen a lot of people do it, and I really wish they didn't. Never, ever, ever send JavaScript over, over if you're doing any kind of protocol, you should be sending data, not code. Um, what I'm talking about is people doing this. Um, the server basically publishes JavaScript, and then the client evals it. And the client is assuming that that code came, came from the server, and it really shouldn't do. And I'm not just talking about people publishing from like wherever on the internet. I'm saying, like, unless you're doing TLS, you can't even assume the data that came from your server is real, because people can man in the middle it. 
So if someone has access to your connection, if you're on a shared Wi-Fi network, for example, people can make your browser execute arbitrary code if it's doing this. Um, and the reason you can't do this is you can't validate JavaScript for safety. There's a, there isn't enough static information in JavaScript to be able to tell what it's going to do in advance without executing it. So basically, to tell what JavaScript is going to do, like decide whether it's safe, you need to execute it. And because it's Turing complete, that basically means that securing this is equivalent to trying to solve the halting problem. So I hope you're not busy this weekend because you're going to have a lot of time getting this to work. Um, and like I said, you can't actually trust that the code came from your server because people can intercept stuff unless you're doing a secure connection. Um, you can make this a little bit safe um, by saying that, um, so by default, Faye will let anybody publish messages into it. But if you make it so that, and you shouldn't do this, but if you are doing it, this is how to make it safe. Um, make sure that only your server is the one who can publish messages. And the way you do that is by requiring a password. So you can have an incoming extension on the server that just checks if somebody's publishing a message, does it have this password attached to it? And if it doesn't, attach an error, and then the thing won't get distributed. Um, you also need an outgoing extension to delete that password off of the message before it's published to everybody out in the world so it doesn't leak out of your servers. And then you just have an outgoing extension on your server-side clients um, that will attach that password to their messages. And they'll, they'll be allowed to publish, but no one else will. And then you can, you can trust your code a little bit more. It's basically you can trust it as much as you can, uh, uh, as much as you can trust a script tag that you, that's addressed to your server. So to finish off, um, a few things that uh, you should read. A lot of this and a bunch more stuff is covered in the face security documentation, uh, which uh, these are all links. If you're going to get the slides, you can follow these. Um, if you want a brief introduction to cryptography, uh, there's a course on Coursera that's six weeks long, and it's really good and sort of terrifying. You'll find out why loads of stuff really doesn't work in practice. Um, the talk I mentioned earlier about input processing and not doing Turing complete wire formats is called The Science of Insecurity. It's on YouTube. I implore you to watch it. It's terrific. Um, and uh, what might be a slightly weird suggestion, um, I think if you want to really understand this stuff, you should take a course on compilers, because learning how to formally process language and thinking about stacks of languages and how they work together um, really trains you to deal with input very, very carefully. I think that's a skill that a lot of people who are doing wide formats and you know network protocols ought to have. So thank you very much for listening.